All right. Uh, I'll talk not so much uh, specifically with respect to bottom ashes, harvested ashes, uh, or coal ashes. I'll talk more broadly on uh, reactivity testing. But I'll try to connect it towards uh, standardization and uh, specification. So my name is Pranay Suryaneni. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Miami. All right. So uh, I think you guys have already heard a little bit about flashes and other SEMs, but I'll still bore you with three slides about SEMs. So uh, big picture, your SEMs can be pozzolanic and or latent hydraulic. Pozzolanic means that these materials react with calcium hydroxide and water. This is a reaction that really happens to a significant extent at high pH, and the product that's formed is CSH. On the other hand, uh, latent hydraulic SEMs, these do not need calcium hydroxide. They can react with the calcium hydroxide, but they do not need calcium hydroxide. So they react with water once activated to form CSH. There could be uh, other reaction products as well. The primary difference between pozzolanic and latent hydraulic SEMs is the presence of calcium. Uh, and then uh, there are inert fillers, which are typically not considered supplementary cementitious materials. These do not, to a large extent, react with water or calcium hydroxide. They can show other reactions to a small extent. Very typical examples of a pozzolanic SEM would be a silica fume, latent hydraulic would be a slag, and an inert filler would be limestone. Now, uh, why do we care? Why do we have to differentiate between these three SEMs? So first, my opinion is that even an inert material can be used in concrete. And it's important to use materials in concrete that reduce the overall uh, cement or PLC content. With that being said, uh, the replacement levels you use in concrete vary very significantly. Uh, inert materials are probably less than 15%, pozzolanic less than 25, latent hydraulic less than 45, just as guides, of course. Uh, these materials have very different benefits for concrete strength and for concrete durability. So the idea for differentiating these materials and measuring reactivity is not to say do not use these class of materials. It's just to say use these kind of materials for a different purpose and in a different way than these kind of materials. So uh, some examples, I mean, to talk about the link between reactivity and durability. So uh, here is a curve which shows that as the calcium hydroxide consumption increases, the AMBT expansion reduces. Here is another curve which kind of shows the same thing, that as the materials become more and more pozzolanically reactive, you need less and less of them to mitigate ASR. Obviously, ASR is much more complex than reactivity, so the connection is a little tenuous. But the point is, generally speaking, if these materials don't have alkalis, etc., you can assume that a very reactive material will mitigate ASR better than an inert material. Uh, well, then the question is, how do we screen or measure for reactivity? Okay, could we just use the bulk chemistry? That is, uh, would the amount of uh, calcium, alumina, silica, etc., tell us something about the reactivity of these materials? The answer is no, it does not, because uh, if you simply consider silica fume versus something like quartz, uh, they have roughly the same uh, bulk composition, which is like 95% SiO2. One of them is reactive, the other is inert, and the reason for that is that it is the amorphous content that drives uh, whether a material is an SEM or not, not so much the bulk content. Uh, there are some examples here which, which again show you the same thing. Can we use the strength activity index? Uh, I think I've made my opinion on this test quite clear. It doesn't really work all that well. <coughs> a value of 70 or 80 or 90 on the strength activity is really all the same. Uh, a lot of inert fillers will pass it because the age of testing, replacement levels, and the test limits are too low. If you're getting an SAI of 100, that's great. <coughs> that's probably a reactive material. But below that, 70, 80, it's all the same thing, just considering error bars, the changed water demand, etc. You can measure calcium hydroxide consumption, and that is important. Lots of tests measure the calcium hydroxide consumption. But they do not accurately quantify reactivity of latent hydraulic SEMs, because as we discussed, they don't need calcium hydroxide to react. There are uh, specific tests, for example, the Chappelle, modified Chappelle, Fratini, which do this. I'm not going to discuss them just because I wanted to keep the scope of my presentation limited, but I will directly discuss calcium hydroxide consumption. Do we need to distinguish pozzolanic and latent hydraulic SEMs? 
Well, as I mentioned, uh, these materials have different effects on durability, different replacement levels. So it could be important to distinguish them. But the reality is also that if something has less than 15 or 20 percent calcium, it's not going to be latent hydraulic. So just the calcium content could be a distinguisher between pozzolanic and latent hydraulic SEMs. Uh, do we need to distinguish total reactivity versus pozzolanic reactivity? Well, again, it depends. Uh, you can actually you know, separate out these materials already through knowing their calcium contents or the calcium oxide contents. So the answer is it depends on what you want, but this is not a particularly hard distinction to make. All right, so let's take a look at how the SCM is actually reacting. So a very simple model system looks like this. We have SCM, you have calcium hydroxide, and you have some kind of alkaline solution. Uh, the SCM will react with the calcium hydroxide and or with the alkaline solution. It will react even at uh, room temperature, but really you need to test it at 40 or 50 to get <laughs> measurable levels of reaction. What can you measure? You can measure dissolution, you can measure heat release, bound water, CH consumption, strength, bulk resistivity. You can vary these proportions as much as you want. You can put sand there, you can put cement there. So lot of lot of different ways of running a reactivity test. So uh, what is your threshold? If an adequate amount of reaction occurs, then the material is an SEM, else it's not. Uh, and, and you know, I always get this question, what is adequate? Why can't you tell me an exact limit? Well, the bottom line is there isn't any exact limit. Uh, reactivity is going to be continuous, not discrete. You can think of taking an inert material, continuously doping it with something very reactive and getting whatever level of reactivity you want, okay? So you have to draw a line somewhere, some level which you find acceptable, but it's not like I can say that, hey, look, below 100 joules or whatever, this is a really not a good material. Above 100 joules is the best material in the world. It doesn't exist. Right? Uh, whatever number you put is somewhat arbitrary. Uh, so you can measure all of these different aspects in model systems, in PACE, in mortars. A lot of different tests do exist to do this. Uh, Chappelle, Fratini, R3, modified R3, etc., etc., etc. Now, some of these tests are a lot more difficult to interpret than others. Uh, for example, if you run in cement paste and mortars, the issue is simply that OPC is an order of magnitude more reactive than SEMs. So if you measure a heat of hydration test of OPC with 20% SEM at seven days, you measure for the most part the response of the OPC. Your SEMs are simply not reacting enough to actually measure their response. So uh, model systems are always better than running a system with cement because you can actually isolate the effect of the SEMs without having the cement. In an ideal world, what you would do is you would differentiate inert, pozzolanic, latent hydraulic SEMs. You'd get some estimate of strength, some estimate of durability. Your test would be rapid, robust, reliable, cheap, and simple. Well, we don't really live in an ideal world. No one test will do all of these. But by cleverly running together multiple tests, maybe we can achieve all of these. So I'll talk about uh, four tests in total. I'll spend most of the time talking about R3 and modified R3 tests, and then I'll cover a couple more. So the R3 test, uh, this is ASTM C1897. So it is a standard ASTM test, which you can run. Uh, here are the mixture proportions. There's calcium hydroxide, SCM, calcium carbonate, potassium hydroxide, K2SO4. You mix them, you run isothermal calorimetry, which tells you the heat release for seven days and or you can uh, put the specimen at seven days in a oven slash a furnace to measure bound water. Uh, we developed, we as in when I was at Oregon State working with Jason Weiss, uh, developed a alternative, the modified R3 test. It's very similar to the R3 test. The big difference is the pore solution or the simulated pore solution is simplified. There is in K2SO4, there is in calcium carbonate. You have calcium hydroxide in SEM, three to one ratio. Uh, 0.5 molar potassium hydroxide, liquid to solid ratio 0.9. Uh, you run at 50 degrees isothermal for 10 days, although I'll show you later that that can be reduced. And then at the end of 10 days, you run thermogravimetric analysis to measure the calcium hydroxide consumption. How do the results look like? 
So uh, we've run now uh, several hundreds of different materials. Uh, it's probably close to 300 to 500 different materials. So if you have any material you want to send me, send it to me and we'll benchmark it versus well, everything else in the world. But uh, inert materials do not really release significant heat. We've tested a few inert materials. For the most part, they are below 50 joule per gram SCM. All of the fly ash we tested were reactive. Uh, the least reactive fly ash in the R3 test was at 50 joule per gram. Uh, the range was from 50 to 400 joule per gram. And in this particular test, which was at 40 degrees, the class of fly ashes have a significantly lower heat at several days than the class C fly ashes. And you can see that these are still reacting, that the rate is still increasing. Uh, so 50 to 400 for a fly ash, but really mostly about 150. The more reactive SEMs, calcine clays or silica fumes, uh, were about 500 joule per gram. And if you ran a pure metakil, then it was at 1,000 or something. Right, so that gives you a range of the reactivity at, at seven days. Uh, one thing to note is that for these slowly reacting siliceous materials, this is still increasing at seven days. And you want to consider the difference between low reactive and slowly reactive. Low is something that's never going to really increase. Slow is something that starts off but keeps releasing heat in a sustained manner. Siliceous materials like class of flashes and most natural puzzlons will have this signature. So this is not to say that these materials will not perform well in concrete. They'll actually perform really well in concrete. How does a modified R3 test look like? This is at 50 Celsius. Inert materials, same thing, less than 50 joule per gram. The fly ash, on the other hand, you can see that there isn't any difference between the class C and the class F at uh, 10 days. That is, all of them have somewhere from 200 to 400 joule per gram. But if you take a closer look, you can see that at early ages, that is in the first one to three days, the class C fly ashes have a much higher heat release than the class F fly ashes. So there is a kinetic effect here where the class F fly ashes initially are less reactive, but at later ages, they are more reactive. As you know, this actually uh, does track the strength and durability behavior that you expect from class of flashes as well. The more reactive materials are uh, 500 to 600. Again, if you test a metakaolin, it goes somewhere around 1,000 joule per gram. Uh, in this test, unlike the R3 test, pretty much everything seems to more or less plateau at 10 days. The reaction kinetics are important. That is, the differences between the class C and class F flashes in the modified R3 tests are significant at early ages, but not so much at later ages. So you don't want to just look at one point, you want to look at the whole reactivity curve, etc. Although we can also predict a lot of these reactivity uh, or reaction kinetics on the basis of uh, chemical composition or on the basis of amorphous content, etc. And actually, it's really very interesting. We, we found that even within the first six hours, uh, you can kind of predict what this material is going to do especially if the materials are very reactive. Anyway, we fit power law curves, we did all of that, and most of the reaction is completed at three days. Uh, well, no, that's not true, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. It's not, that's not correct. It's that there is a very nice correlation between the three day and the 10 day heat release, uh, except for the slowly reacting materials which don't fall on the same curve, but you get about 80% of the heat at 10 days at three days. So technically you can reduce your testing duration to three days. If something is passing at three days, obviously it's going to pass at 10 days. Uh, you may want to have caution with class of flashes or natural on slowly reacting materials, especially if you test at 40. How do these tests compare? Well, uh, here actually there is a little bit of complexity involved. Basically what happens is that if you have uh, siliceous materials, uh, because siliceous glass is not very reactive, the class F and silica fume, for example, in these, the temperature dominates. That is, the heat in the modified R3 test is more than the heat in the R3 test. So something like this. It's the other way around in the materials with high amounts of calcium or alumina. That is, even at 40 degrees, the heat is higher than the heat at 50 degrees. And that is because of the effect of sulfates and carbonates. That is, you get a bunch of these secondary reactions happening with sulfates and carbonates, which contribute to uh, the reaction. These uh, the reaction heat, I mean, these reactions do not happen to a significant extent for siliceous materials. So actually, uh, we found that there was a crossover in the sense that in all cases, actually, the R3 
would ultimately exceed the modified R3 because of uh, additional reactions. It's just that in some cases that crossover point might be a year or something, right? Now the question is, do these differences matter? Well, uh, it depends on what you want to do. If you just want to classify materials, if you want to look at pass fail, if you want to uh, use them for specifications, I'd argue that they don't really matter. If you want to do them, uh, use them in research projects to make some predictions about strength and durability, then these differences matter. I talked about two different metrics, heat release and calcium hydroxide consumption. If you take away high calcium materials, which are the slags, okay, for the most part, these two metrics track. That is, uh, the heat release correlates pretty nicely with the calcium hydroxide consumption, except if you're talking about uh, latent hydraulic materials. There is actually a little bit of a difference here that the modified R3 shows a better correlation than the R3. This seems to be because of a vertical offset of these fly ashes, the class C fly ashes. I think, again, that this corresponds to secondary reactions which may or may not involve calcium hydroxide that leads to that uh, vertical offset. But anyway, to a certain extent, if you know your heat release, you can predict your calcium hydroxide or vice versa. Not, of course, for uh, latent hydraulic materials. So, uh, okay, hey, you know, I don't care about standards or tests. I want to use them in specifications. What values do I use? There was a lot of discussion in this at uh, ASCM. Personally, I like 100 joule per gram. You can go a little bit higher, a little bit lower. It doesn't matter all that much. But uh, we, we really haven't seen anything reactive below 100 joule per gram, whether you run an R3, a modified R3, or a variant. Uh, there might be some you know, caution that you need to take uh, depending on kinetics, et cetera. But for the most part, 100 is, is a nice uh, differentiator between reactive and unreactive materials. Okay, uh, how does uh, the bound water look? There's a pretty nice correlation between the heat release and the bound water. This correlation exists for both the R3 and the modified R3 tests. Again, there's a little bit of difference in the strength of the correlation. I don't know that it matters. This isn't that many points. Uh, you could also use a furnace to estimate the bound water and the calcium hydroxide consumption. Uh, and uh, essentially, this would be a two-step furnace where you heat it up from uh, 100 something to 380 and then from 380 to 550 to get the calcium hydroxide consumption using uh, the, the furnace mass loss. So uh, if you want to use a bound water number, uh, 5 or 3 to 5 uh, percent of bound water is a good differentiator between reactive and unreactive materials. Oh my God, I do not want to use these complicated tests, furnace, calorimetry, TGA. Can we talk about something simpler? Yes, we can. So uh, bulk resistivity, which hopefully should be a simpler test than uh, isothermal calorimetry, is a fantastic measure. So uh, many of you may or may not have noticed that when you measure your bulk resistivity over long times with SCMs, the bulk resistivity keeps going up if you have SCMs. Control cement does not really go up in the same way, or a controlled concrete does not go up. So uh, this is common where uh, you know fillers reduce resistivity. If you have reactive SCMs in your mix, especially at high replacement, uh, at high temperature, your bulk resistivity will increase. Bulk resistivity, it's an indirect measure, to be clear. Do not take a value of resistivity and correlate it to some measure of reactivity because there's far too many things that affect resistivity. But the resistivity is highly sensitive to reactivity, and it's a durability measure as well, so maybe you can kill two birds with one stone. So uh, what we proposed was this bulk resistivity index, where we said, hey, if you really want SEMs to increase in uh, resistivity, it's going to take you a very long time. Instead of that, why don't you try to increase your temperature and increase your replacement level? So we proposed using 50% replacement and 50 Celsius uh, heat curing. Under these conditions, uh, you actually see differences when you run a SAI type test as well, but again, the, the error bars are so significant here that I'm not sure I'd put too much weight to this. But if you take a look at the resistivity, uh, inert materials show the same resistivity as the control, whereas reactive materials show an increase of resistivity 1,200, 3,500%, right? So if you heat something up at uh, 50 Celsius, use 50% of the SEM, over the long term, the resistivity will increase, and you can use this to measure the reactivity of your materials. If you think that this is also too complex, uh, I have a simpler suggestion for you. Strength, but not strength activity. Keep the cement out of there just to make your life easy. So there's a lot of uh, line strength tests that people have proposed, uh, line Poisson tests, uh, there are other names to it, modified line strength. 
So this is from uh, Mike Thomas, Mahipal Kasania, and others. And essentially, uh, I have all the details here which show the mixture design, the curing conditions. Uh, but basically, if you take a lime mortar, calcium hydroxide, and you mix it with a pozzolan, you have to again cure it at some temperature. So if your material is not reactive at all, you won't get any strength. As your material reactivity starts to increase, the strength starts to increase. So uh, for example, uh, something like a metakaolin or a silica fume will give you very high strengths, whereas a flashes will give you strengths somewhere in between you know, zero and the value that you get for a silica fume or a metakaolin. So uh, strength testing is as simple as it gets, greater strength, greater reactivity. Uh, they have shown significant correlations to RP results, to motor properties, and to other things as well. All right, uh, now let's talk about standards and specifications. The R3 test is already a standard. It's ASCMC 1897. Use it if you're able to use it. Now, we could standardize the modified R3 test, uh, which is the 50 Celsius test I talked about, but I honestly think it's a lot of uh, work, data is needed, etc. I'm Personally, I'm not sure that's where I'd put my effort. We all know how ASTM can be. Uh, it might be much more valuable, in my personal opinion, to get ASTM C1897 into specifications. I know uh, ASTM is seriously working on that, but that might be a more valuable route. And we have numbers. I mean, there's plenty of data that suggests, as an example, that 50 or 100 joule per gram of heat could be, could be a great first start. Heat release, bound water, calcium hydroxide consumption, all similar enough. Anyone could be used, it could be acceptable, uh, especially if you cleverly combine them with chemical composition. Uh, I believe there is merit in standardizing the bulk resistivity index and line strength test. They are much simpler uh, than the R3 tests, or at least we perceive them to be. Getting those into specifications will obviously take some years, so that's it's not as simple as that. Uh, and, and, and the nice thing is everyone is familiar with the compressor strength test, so in principle, anyone could run this. Let's say you go, I don't even have a compression test machine. And there are some startups who might be in that state. What do you do? Well, here's my idea of a poor man's reactivity test. Let's say you want to qualitatively assess SEM reactivity, and you have absolutely no tools to be able to do it. Well, this is my suggestion. I haven't validated it, but this is based on some observations. Take, uh, I suggest five grams SEM, 15 grams calcium hydroxide, 18 grams half a molar potassium hydroxide, but you can take whatever, it doesn't matter. Store it at 38, 40, or 50. 38 might be ideal because that's your uh, ASR oven uh, or ASR chamber anyway. Say the material hardens in less than one day, all right? Uh, you can just press your material, see if it's hardened, you can try to deform it. If it hardens in one day, uh, well, this material seems to be highly reactive. If it takes about three days, then there's a moderate uh, reactivity level. If it takes about 14 days, then the reactivity level is low or mild. If the material is never hardening, then it's inert. Uh, we know limestone is not going to react in such circumstances, so you can always run this with a limestone control, run all your other materials with this, so you can check. Uh, if you want to obviously quantify this, or if you want to do a little better than, hey, this is hard, this is not, uh, maybe someone could run a YCAT test, like a YCAT penetration test on a few of these SEMs, and then compare with uh, the strength of the heat. So, uh, well, pretty much that's, that's what I had. It's important to measure reactivity, how you measure it is maybe not that important. I'd obviously always suggest to uh, run it according to a standard, which would be 1897, but the other tests are also okay. You may wanna check some sort of threshold, some sort of benchmarking. Uh, reactivity gives you some idea of strength and durability, but you still need to measure base motor or concrete properties because they are very important before you can use this material. So thank you very much for your attention, uh, sponsors, and my team. Thank you.